I don't know how to describe it other than like like a demon type of sound. But it's silhouetted, hulking, every bit of five and a half feet wide, 13 to 14 foot tall, pitch black. The one thing that ran through my mind when I had this encounter was I don't have a big enough gun. Your host, two-time witness and field researcher for more than 40 years, William Jevnik. Welcome to Creek Devil. Yeah, we definitely destroyed some records at um, the uh, Casualty Operations Center that they had kept over the years, you know, and uh, were shall we say, incriminating when we moved those records from the D.C. area to where they are now. Now, you saw um, those records when you were, were moving other documents, right? Um, right. We were moving all of the casualty records from where they were near D.C. to a secure area. Um, and, of course, that secure area is in Kentucky. And... Uh, we did that in 2010 and 2009 and in 2010 is when we destroyed all of the records that what we were told is that the records no longer needed to be kept because they um had expired you know so <laughs> we were told to put them in the incinerator which me and the other soldiers obviously did now, I, I was told by another friend of mine yesterday that he may have kept some of the records of this airplane that we're talking about now, that he may have a picture, in fact, of how the airplane landed in the lake. Oh, that very they interesting. Took as an, yeah. It was an aerial photograph that was in the, uh, the record that we originally destroyed, and I didn't know he'd kept any of it, but I was talking to him yesterday, and he said, yeah, that um, maybe he has some of those records. And he may be able to get me some copies of them here in the next few months. So I'm hoping that he did keep some of those, even though we weren't supposed to. Right. That would be so fascinating to see that. Yeah, I would love to see it again, too, because, you know, it's been oh, more than 10 years since I saw it. So I'd love to refresh my memory on it. But if memory serves me correctly, what happened is that that plane, for whatever reason, went down in this alpine lake which was uh, part of the um, Fort Lewis mountain training area. Mm -hmm. And uh, those people may or may not have been alive when, they, when the plane crashed, but um, what happened is that something or someone definitely ate those people on the uh, shores of that lake, whether or not they were dead or not. After the plane crashed, we didn't know. You know, because the record didn't say. It just said that they were, you know, eaten and their bones scraped on the edge of the lake. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Well, I guess going, let's go back. Yeah. Um, when you when you first saw those documents that you were moving, uh -huh. I remember you told me yeah. that you had asked if you could look at those, and they said, sure, they were going to be destroyed anyway. Well, what sorts of yeah. things did you see in those documents? Well, there was evidence of, a plethora of casualties over the years from like way going way back to the civil war <laughs> wow. that had been ca clearly caused by some type of man-like creature and the majority of them occurred in the northwest of of the united states up in northern california and washington and oregon although some of them definitely occurred in the Himalayas, including one where where at least 16 Special Forces soldiers were killed and injured in the Himalayas. Wow. Yeah. And you said there were quite a few of those records around 1100, was that right? Or Yeah, it was 2011 that we, um, when I was doing a lot of casualty operations, but we destroyed most of the records in 2010 when we moved them now there we kept a, a room full of them that were basically over it sounds silly but overflowing the incinerator there was too many of them to put in at once so 
the ones that they considered not quite as sensitive, we just threw them in a room and left them there in the room until they could make it to the incinerator. And they definitely stayed, some of them there till 2013 and 2014 when my two friends that were still on that operation were, you know, incinerating them. And what do those records say? I mean, I remember you mentioned, um, you know, you know they, uh, I'm going to Yeah, sorry. That they all had different, you know, cases. Like some of them were silly, like one guy that was clearly a makeup case where they, they thought the soldier had absconded for whatever reason and they wanted to take care of his wife. And so they said he was eaten by a shark. Most of them were... Things that the Army found embarrassing for whatever reason, like, you know, Special Forces soldiers encountered Sasquatches and said, hey, we this is definitely what it was. And all of them had the same story. And then those, you know, soldiers that remembered it were all transferred to different places. And then the records were kept in D.C., you know, until we destroyed them. I'm sure those soldiers were had to sign NDAs where they would never disclose any of that information, too. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and we signed NDAs, too, which my NDA was only temporary. It was a seven-year non-disclosure agreement, and then I've, I've been retired for longer than that, so I feel comfortable letting you know that, you know, there was people over the years that were injured by Sasquatches. And you mentioned they, yeah. when they, when the, some of the documents you read that the the aircraft would go down, and the creatures would make right. a beeline to them, and and yeah, exactly, and that's pretty much what happened in that plane that we were talking about that went down in the eighties that took off from the Mount Hood, Oregon area, and I, I crashed in that mountain training area at Fort Lewis, and then yeah, they basically did it's, i don't know if it was like a beacon when the plane went down or what i imagine it was and like because there's a water plume and smoke and fire going up if a plane goes down in the lake sure do you remember if it was and, uh, was a fixed wing aircraft or helicopter it was a fixed wing aircraft oh okay. it was a fixed wing aircraft with about maybe half a dozen people on it and landed in the lake and the photo that was in the record showed like the one wing broken off the aircraft where the aircraft had clearly i don't know if they made an emergency landing in the lake or if they just crashed into the lake or for whatever reason it hit the lake with a resounding crash and pulled off the right wing of the aircraft when it hit the lake and then the people it, it looked like maybe some of the people were still alive and had tried to get out of the lake on the east side of the lake and then that's where whatever it was that was out there ate them on the shores of the lake holy cow i used to wonder when i was stationed at fort lewis why they placed so much emphasis on downed aircraft missions and that puts a whole new spin on it for me <laughs> right because they had to get there quick so they couldn't let it out for some reason back at that time there was a like a wall of secrecy about this. They didn't want to let people know that perhaps there were still some, you know, human-like beings that are really hairy and maybe slightly large. And that's what I could determine from reading all the reports. Because you know, you know how the armies hurry up and wait. So oh, yeah. hurried up and got all the records there near the incinerator, and then sat around burning them as quick as we could. But of course those incinerators can only take so much paper right and this was literally three 18 wheeler trailer loads full of, of records that's amazing right yeah it was a lot of records it was a total of all the records we brought of 16 trailer loads full of records but the only the three of them did they tell us hey these all are expired and need to be incinerated I wonder I wonder if they still main, they must still maintain some kind of records of of those kinds of incidents. So there's a database at Fort Knox, um, and some of the records we're instructed to file in the database, but most of those were 
not ones where it was obvious that some other kind of being or aliens or sharks or whatever it was that hurt the soldier. It was just, ca- it's, you know, straight casualty stuff that we were putting in the database. The stuff that we were told to incinerate was the stuff that was a little iffy. Yeah, I would imagine they wouldn't want the public to know too much of that. Um, I remember doing no. funeral detail for a while at Fort Lewis and, you know, if right. there were guys that were being buried that were our age, and there were some, um, it was yeah. always, you know, training accidents. Right, it was a training accident, yeah. So, yeah, any of those casualties that um, we destroyed the records of, they they were labeled as other things. They just blatantly, our parents and grandparents' generation, for whatever reason, was not shy about covering up evidence and lying about what they were doing. That's true. They just did it, basically did it straightforward. They said, hey, we're going to change what this says, and you're going to do it. And we said, okay, you know, you're the boss as ordered. Yes, sir. Yeah, that's true. I I was in from 76 to 86, and remember all that very well. Yeah. So, yeah, that's what they did, and... One of the funny things is one of the the older um, form, former soldiers who was working on this records project with us, he had been in during the Vietnam War and, you know, gotten injured and become a civilian government worker. So he was doing the same thing we were doing, but he was a civilian government worker. He told us, hey, you know, we used to see some strange furry um like giant apes on the south end of fort knox when we were um, growing some hippie drugs down by the uh uh tank ranges down there and we quit growing it down there because it was a little bit scary (laughs) you know it's interesting I, i don't think i would have thought about the creatures being at knox when i went through basic and ait there but uh, it was yeah. certainly jungle enough, like, for something to be out there. Right. And I spent oh, almost seven years of my 20-year career at Fort Knox. And um, there was definitely some strange stuff going on on South Post. And for some reason now, all those firing ranges and hunting areas and lakes are off limits. Really? That's interesting. Yeah. They closed, they had built this enormous, vast tank range on South Fort Knox. In fact, even purchased some civilian land to build the tank range and spent millions of dollars building the tank range. And for some reason, that tank range, which was the most modern tank range in the world, was put off limits and abandoned by the Army. (laughs) Well, I remember when they moved. And no civilians or soldiers can go there anymore. <laughs> yeah, they. I always thought it was odd they moved the armor center from Knox to Benning. Um, right. You know, because Knox was all, think, already set up for all that. Right. I think it may have had to do with Sasquatches on Fort Knox, and they may have been, you know, protecting their habitat for study or future generations or whatever. Well, Tom is trying to. I think there is an element that wants an element of the society, and especially in the high ups in the military, that actually is very interested in protecting the Sasquatches and using their DNA to make stronger soldiers for the future. Oh, that's interesting. You know, when we we talked to Mister Black, he said that what got the uh, the U.S. involved in the topic to begin with was rumors that the soviets were going to use their versions of the creatures to make super soldiers and uh, right. of course I, I served during the cold war so i remember very well especially doing border duty in germany um we yeah. paid very close attention to anything no matter how crazy it sounded that the russians were saying or doing right and uh, you know would would uh, do our best to figure out what it was they were up to exactly and so this and along those same lines, I'm pretty sure that was part of the mission in the Himalayan training area where we were doing the joint operation with the Indian Special Forces, yeah. where those 16 Special Forces soldiers, and this one was helicopters, were um, 
they went up there in three helicopters and somehow two of those three helicopters got knocked down wow that's interesting yeah yeah well tom has joined us tom's gonna have questions too yeah Yeah. 16 soldiers were um became casualties in that incident you know i have a friend that lives in new delhi and he he's from actually from liverpool he's he's english but he works in Bollywood, and, and he knows the number of people uh-huh. that are in Indian Special Forces. And apparently, uh, from what he told me, it was kind of interesting. Um, he said that the Tigers are making a big comeback in that part of India. Oh, yeah. And he says, because the Indian they Special are. Forces go out and just kill anybody they think are poachers. <laughs> but yeah. but they said they're deathly afraid of the Yeti, and, and they will not go into an area where there have been reports of one being seen. Right. Interestingly, that is what the report uh, said. And, of course, we were supposed to destroy that one, too. I don't know if my friend maintained any of those pictures, but he said he had several pictures of downed aircraft where um, he he really is interested in what knocks the airplanes out of the sky. He's like, how, how possibly could a Sasquatch get an airplane down? Um, and we kind of were talking and we're making a hypothesis that perhaps it was the rifles that they had stolen from, you know, careless hunters and soldiers. Yeah. <clears throat> That's something. Yeah. Cause you can knock an okay. aircraft down with small arms fire. You just have to know how to do it. Oh yeah. You get them, get a helicopter in the transmission or something. It's going down. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So Tom, so Tom, you said. Tom, are you on with us? Yeah. I'm on. There yes. he is. <laughs> Colonel, how you doing? Uh, Captain, yeah, I'm doing great. But thank okay. you very much. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah. Um, yeah. I don't know if Will asked his question. Is it okay if I uh, just jump in with a question? Absolutely. Go ahead. Um, I know you dealt with uh, down military craft. Did you ever have information on down uh, civilian craft, and specifically, Will knows the one I'm talking about. Yeah. A, a small commuter, commercial commuter plane went down in the late uh-huh. 80s in Oregon in the Mount right. Hood uh, wilderness. Right. And when the SAR team got there, uh, there could have been no survivors, but there was nobody inside the craft or the remains of the craft or outside the craft. And and I, I remember watching it on the news, and the, the news... Mm-hmm. Anchors were absolutely stymied, befuddled, and right. you know made you know comments like "Did UFOs get them?" or something like that. Right. Have you heard of this? Definitely, I've heard of it. We destroyed those records at Fort Knox in 2009 and 2010. We brought those casualty records. That was that happened in the in the Army Fort, in the Army's Fort. Uh, Lewis Mountain Training Area. So aircraft had taken off. As I recall from the Mount Hood area, and there was maybe half a dozen passengers on board. And it crashed in an alpine lake. I don't know if it was weather or if something brought it down. But yeah, it appeared that maybe some people had swam out of the aircraft or whatever. But on the shores, what the Army investigators found was um, three cook fires and some scraped bones and the remains of those um, civilians that had been eaten by whatever it was up there near that lake that um, saw the aircraft go down or heard it go down and went to the area where it had uh, gone down for whatever reason. So the Army got involved even though this was a uh, civilian incident? Right, because um, when something happens in an area that's controlled by the Army, the Army will always send the casualty team up there, even if it's not, you know, soldiers. If it's whatever happens in an Army-controlled area, you know, we take we take charge of it. Yeah. yeah. It was a very that strange... mountain training area is vast, um, like 156,000 acres is that area up there now that's controlled by the army very uh very rugged very uh remote yeah 
Right. It's a mountain training area for um, Joint Base Lewis McCord. Yeah, which back then was just called Fort Lewis, you know. Yeah, yeah. I've actually spent area. time. I've There's, actually spent time training in that area. Right, and it is an exceptionally rugged area. It is when the army wants to train, you know, special forces to go to the Himalayas or the African mountains or somewhere in the Middle East, Afghanistan to work up in the mountains. That's the best place to train them. I actually yeah. read a report that I'm pretty sure was the same one. It was, uh, I pulled it off the NTSB site. Mm -hmm. um, very, very uh, perfunctory and very, um, not sanitized, but it was just very, right. no mention of the person, of the people on board the plane at all. Right. And that's the easy way to do it is you just say, well, we don't know what happened to them. <laughs> and sometimes they would come up with other reasons like the, one that they said was eaten by a shark or somebody <laughs> who was hurt in a training accident or whatever. But, um, I mean, we would laugh for weeks about that one eaten by a shark. Uh-huh. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, that was, yeah. uh, that reminded me of the SNL land shark, uh, skits. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. Right. Eaten by a land shark. Yeah. So yeah, there's definitely something out there. And in a lot of the areas, like I was, Ellen Will just a minute ago, the areas have now been declared off limits for training and off limits for civilians. So I think what they're doing is that the higher ups want to use the, the DNA of those task watches to make super soldiers for the future. Well, at least stronger soldiers, maybe stronger and dumber. I don't know. <laughs> That's uh Wow, that's that's very bizarre, but also creepy. I mean, I know as a former as a former uh, sergeant, I, I could comment on on dumber or the soldiers. I don't know if I'd want them dumber, but <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I shouldn't right. say that. <laughs> yeah, I know. Sometimes, sometimes you wonder. You're like, well, did they already mix a Sasquatch in with this guy, or what? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean. I did have a friend in the army that we called Tree Tree Williams, and uh, he was like six foot seven, and he was not the brightest bulb in the box. Hmm. Yeah, so maybe he had a little bit of Sasquatch in his family already. And you never know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, but they, I, I, I'm sure they're doing something strange with it because otherwise, why would they? They're like almost protecting the areas, you know, <clears throat> setting up yeah. fences and saying hunting off limits in this area, et cetera, et cetera. Well, it's a bi-directional hunting, areas. right? Uh, oh, yeah. And <laughs> <laughs> well, can you tell you know, me you about can... some of the specific accounts um, that you had read? Yeah, one of them that stuck out for me was this civilian plane that went down in that um, lake, you know. I I was interested in it, and I remember looking at all of the documents and everything that the Army investigators, they sent a whole team of investigators up there to see what was going on, had written. They definitely found, you know, footprints and scraped bones and cooked fires where but what they couldn't find is where they had come from, but they didn't find where they had gone. Yeah. Did, also, um, some of the parts of the, the remains that they gathered were missing, like missing arms, missing legs, which, you know, a society that was preserving or salting meat would take. Yeah. That is just you know? really strange. How did, how did the, are you, privy to any way that the army um or were they even involved in controlling the media because obviously that's not the sort of thing you want on right. the I, news well back in the 80s it was pretty easy to just tell the media to say whatever you wanted them to say so the public affairs office just said say we don't know what happened to them <laughs> yeah say that they disappeared it was a mystery 
Yeah, and that was that was the exact story that I saw in the news. Was uh, and I think I think it was on the six o'clock, and they said a follow up on eleven. There was no follow up, as I recall, and right. it was just absolute bewilderment by the news anchors of well, what happened to these people. You know, plane crash. Right. There could be no survivors. Nobody's in the mm-hmm. nobody's in the fuselage. Nobody's outside. Yeah. Right. Right. The plane was empty as if maybe somebody, a few of them at least had survived and uh, taken their gear out because there was some gear in the lake and stuff that they found, like a a metal plate that was in the lake, like a, you know, mess set, you know, civilian camp mess set. Yeah. And um a pocket knife that they found the pocket knife was still folded up when they found it and on the edge of the lake making you know as lakes move they move the dirt around but if you go up there quick you can usually find whatever people dropped as they were swimming out of the lake and they did they found mess kits and a knife and a part of a shoulder strap from a, a backpack do you like recall that. what year this was? It was sometime in the 80s. I want to say 84, maybe. Sometime around there. Yeah. Sometime you in know, the 80s. Did they, do you know the name of the lake by chance? I don't know the name of the Alpine Lake. There's a lot of little valleys up there in that mountain training area. And each little valley and finger has a some, a small alpine lake in it where the water is like washing back into the mountain as it rains. Yeah. Oh uh, yeah, yeah. I think I know what you're talking about. Yeah, those. Right. Same. Yeah. They're they're, shallow. Yeah. Shallow alpine lakes. And yeah. cold. Super cold. Very cold. Yeah, icy <laughs> cold. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I swam in one in mid August one time and it was dramatically cold even then. <laughs> right. Yeah. We just came down from our friend's place up at Grateful Living, which is like at eight thousand some feet. And the water up there is just freezing now. And you know, it's late summer, so this is the warmest the water ever gets up there. Yeah. Yeah. The water would have been frigid. So if anybody was in the lake for any period of time they would have got hypothermia and died anyway, but you know, these people obviously were, uh, if they were dead when they got out of the plane, they were pulled to the shore for whatever reason and eaten by those creatures. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Well, what about was, some uh, of the other? Several, uh, oh, yeah, yeah, that's there what were several was... other ones. And there was a lot of them, you know, three truckloads is a lot of evidence. <laughs> um, so... I remember another one where three soldiers were um, on a, in a truck waiting as like um, receiving road guards for a road march that was happening in the same mountain training area at Fort Lewis. And uh, one of them was off to the side of the road urinating and he disappeared into the bushes. That's what his two friends said. And uh, they looked for him for three days. And uh, eventually they found some shredded parts of his uniform and his hat, but that's all they found from him. Uh, They didn't find his weapon or or any of his gears. Now, of course, in that incident, it's mysterious because the soldier was taken by something in the forest. It could have been other people. It could have been, you know, a bear, (laughs) but um, his friend said, that when he went to urinate, they had a really strange feeling like something was watching them in the training area. And the um, one, there was three of them sitting in the front of a, a deuce and a half truck in the incident. And the one that went to investigate said that he heard something like dragging off into the bushes and he thought it was his friend walking farther off the road to urinate so he just went back to the truck but then the soldier just of course disappeared yeah you know I, I and the weapons 
are they're only loaded with blanks is that right they're not live rounds um well only maybe only about half the time are we training with blanks the rest of the time um you know we started training with live rounds a lot in after the afghan and iraqi wars started we realized hey maybe people don't learn quite as well with (laughs) blanks all the time so maybe only half the time now our soldiers carrying blanks in training uh, the other half of the time it's live ammunition yeah i can i can tell you from having been a mm-hmm. squad leader uh with the three five mm-hmm. cav back in seven from 79 to 81 um right. around that time it's when they first came out with the the night vision goggles the and a and pvs fives and they gave me a set to right. use to try out to see if i'd like them so right. i had a 15 man squad and we we were sent out to the uh uh, we were way out, um, oh, geez, out towards the Nisqually River in that part of Fort Lewis, and there was nobody else mm-hmm. out there. They flew us out there and dropped us off, and I got a call on the radio from my boss, and he said, hey, there's, you know, we're not going to do anything tonight. There's nobody out there. You can you can do whatever you want. You can stand down. You can train. You just We'll come and pick you up the first thing in the morning. I said, okay. So I told the team leaders, they said, all right, we're going to practice some ambushing, so you know, set your fire teams up, and uh, we'll run some of these drills. So I took my radio man in between the two fire teams, and we walked into this tree line. You know, I'm in a position where I can control both fire teams. And right. the ANPBS fives were okay. They were way better than the old Starlight scopes, but not a whole lot that first generation. Right. And I could yeah. see where I was going, but I couldn't see real well in this tree line. And as I walked right. in there. And my poor, my poor PFC, he was, you know, you're supposed to keep your radio man at arm's length away so you can grab that radio at any moment and use it. Um, right. I see this shape, and the only thing, way I can describe it, it's like the size of a sheet of plywood in front of me, and it's black. And it takes one step from right. my right to my left, and I about crap myself. Because I'd encountered one of these yeah. things, I, I grew up near Fort Lewis, just, you know, a number of years before. Right. And I instantly knew what it was without even seeing a, a lot of detail. Right. And I'm, I'm, I'm telling him, I'm backing up into the poor kid. I said, out, 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 get out of the tree line now, out, go. <laughs> and he's confused, but I'm wise. shoving him out of there, right? <laughs> and I hollered for yeah, the team you leaders. you saved your life on that one. Yeah, no kidding. I, I hollered for the team leaders. I said, assemble on me. We're, we're going to stand down for the night. And the area we were in, it was on a road, an old, old uh, tank trail. I mean, an old one. It was very mm-hmm. seldom used, but it was grown up with grass. And I right. said, all right, you know, it was a big open right. area. I said, all right, just, you know, pick a buddy, sit back to back. We're going to crash out for the night till he picks up. And yeah. uh, we sat there for maybe 20, 30 minutes. And one of the guys says, hey, Sarge, I thought you said there was no aggressors out here. And I said, yeah, there's nobody out in this part of the base at all tonight. And he said, well, I hear somebody walking around us. And then a couple of the other guys piped up and he said, yeah, somebody's walking around us. You can hear it real clear. And then one of the guys says, yeah. hey, Sarge, you're from this area. What do you know about Bigfoot? <laughs> no. And, and, and yeah. you know, we t- I told him what I'd seen as a teenager. And uh, and I would bet you that every one of those guys to this day would swear that that's what was circling us for a while that night. Oh, I'm sure it was. Yeah, there was just so many of them from Fort Lewis and <clears throat> the mountain training area. And also the training areas in Northern California and the training areas on the coast of Oregon, you know, there's, there was a ton of casualty reports enough that, that somebody decided that we needed to destroy them. Did the army ever, that that you're aware of, did they ever take and go to the next step of either working directly with uh, other agencies or themselves maybe set up a a task force to study the creatures and try to learn a little bit more about them? You know, all I, my main experience with it was just reading through those casualty records. So I didn't see any of that in any of those casualty records. Um, but we definitely speculated about it. We thought, you know, with all of these casualties, I'll bet that somebody out there is doing something else with these incidences. Um, you know, especially some of the ones that um, we were told to leave in that room for a while. Some of the ones that were a little iffy that kind of 
showed the area that the creatures were working in, so to speak. Some of those, especially one that had like 68 photographs of bones in it. I was told, hey, just, you know, you got to leave this in this box here and we'll destroy it. You know, over the next few years, there's maybe half a dozen boxes full like that that we left there for whatever reason. Ones that were like geographically describing the areas that the creatures were, you know, living their lives in, doing whatever it is they do. That's interesting. So the Army knew about it. um, And it's, you know, look at it from their standpoint. It's not their fault. Mm. They didn't invite the things in. They just, there they are. You know, I, I think about it in terms of, you know, when America became a nation and did George Washington have a clue? No, you know, did I, the government have a clue? No, I, I think some of the higher no. ups. I think some of the higher ups in the army do at least privately discuss it. I have a friend that I've known for many mm-hmm. years since we were privates together, and he retired as an O six, a uh, full colonel. Mm-hmm. And he told me, I asked him, I, I, and he says, "Well, we, we'll talk in private sometime." And I said, "Okay." Yeah, and that's all he would say. Yeah, and what I'm pretty sure is that, yeah, there are. There's probably a few, you know. DIA programs or black ops programs that um, are off books that are doing the experiments that need to be done, you know, to keep our nation safe, whatever they are. What, what can you, I'm wondering if there may be, because these, these stories are fascinating. If there might maybe have a couple or even three or four more that stuck out that you remember, um, what can, sure. what can you tell us? Sure. And there was another one where um, a whole squad at Fort Lewis was mar- doing a road march, and they were all certain that they had seen what they all called a large ape in the early morning on the side of the road. And uh, two of them have, had decided to go off and investigate. And those two never came back. And one of the interesting things about that squad where the two went missing was that none of their equipment, again, was ever recovered. And they both had, well, one of them had a pistol and he had a 1911 and an M16A2. And the other guy had an M16A2 and all of the A gunner stuff, you know, the for the squad machine gun. So he had, you know, several thousand rounds linked together of five five six, you know. And they had smoke grenades and all kinds of other stuff with them too. So if they had um encountered anything that they had time to react to, they didn't use any of their weapons or smoke. So obviously it Whatever happened to those two happened quick. And yeah, that's what I find interesting. Right. Yeah. So you can yeah. be as armed as you like, but if, uh, you know, you get a boulder flying out of the forest and hits you in the side of the head, what are you going to do? Yeah, you can't look at, out the back of your head, <laughs> like my friend was telling me yesterday. You can't stop a rock from behind. You know, I was no going right. to say, strong you are. in the early 80s, yeah. all we carried was blanks. That's all we were allowed to use. I was, I was actually the ammo NCO for our, our uh, uh-huh. battalion, and that's all we were allowed right. to use except on ranges. But you could take, you could get yeah. a lot of blanks, and we had my squad had two M60 machine guns, and we had, I don't know, several thousand rounds, and I told the guys, they said, well... You know, if these things decide they're going to get a little aggressive with us, we we can't hurt them, but we can sure light the area up pretty noisy. And <laughs> we, yeah, you know, I, I figured. Well, I I think they probably didn't bother us because there were you know, fifteen of us out there mm. in a group. So right, I think that yeah, I in most of the incidents as I read, where the people got in trouble is where they were off in the woods, two or three of them, or one or two of them. And uh, something had been happening, and you know how some soldiers are aggressive, and they got to go out there and see what it is. Oh yeah, young and dumb. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah, that's what every member, other member of that squad said, is that they were really interested in that that eight 
they called it a large eight that they'd seen on the side of the road. And uh, so they, like, chased it off into the undergrowth and, and never came back. Yeah. And I'm curious about the missing equipment and weapons. I've heard it, right. I've heard it from another source that they uh, said the creatures actually uh, buried them so they wouldn't be found. But I'm just wondering if in any of the reports, was there any mention of uh, discovered equipment, weapons, well, anything of, of that one, sort? One that was very strange <clears throat> said that some soldiers and um, this one was also from the mountain training area. I'd say about maybe half the reports were from the Fort Lewis area, which indicates there's a lot of those creatures up there around. So this was a really interesting one where um, some soldiers were um, on an evening guard at their little fire base that they'd set up in the, out in the training area. Cause you know how you set up a fire base and a patrol base and everything. They were on an evening guard and they heard a shot. And one of them said, Oh, that sounded like a hunter and the hunters aren't supposed to be in this area. Let's go see what it is. And so their squad leader told them, yeah, you can go see because there shouldn't be anybody shooting out here. And they heard a single shot, boom, you know, like usually as a hunter. So they went out there and they found a 30 out six casing. And we only know that they found it because we found part of one of the soldiers lower torsos with his pants and the 30 out six casing in the right pocket of his pants. So we figured that they had gone to where they heard the shot. And then the other soldiers that were with them heard two more shots. And those two soldiers didn't come back, but the other soldiers went down there really fast to the area where they're in, and they found the lower torso of one of the soldiers severed. Like maybe the creatures, or, or it could have been, you know, cannibals using rifles. Could have been people, I have to admit that. Um, had shot these soldiers and uh, butchered them essentially because one lower torso was left when the whole squad went down, went down to see what was going on. Yeah. But you know, you think yeah. about the strength it takes to dismember, uh, you know, the joints and the, all the connective tissue. Right. And well, I guess it would have mattered. Right. It's tremendous. It would depend on whether yeah, and in that the damage instance, looked cut or been, torn. It was definitely, um, cut you know somebody had used some kind of knife on this instance but very fast this the squad leader in that instance estimated that it had been less than 15 minutes that those soldiers had been gone when they heard the second two shots and went down to look after them that is quick see where they were you know yeah that's quick he said you know i sent him with his battle buddy so he'd be fine but well, that was really fast. <laughs> but they heard a shot. Hey, we got to go see what that was. There's not supposed to be hunters in this area. They went down there. They heard the rest of the squad heard two more shots. And then all they recovered was the lower torso of one soldier. Yeah. And when? he had in his pocket a thirty out six round. They, they, checked the round for fingerprints and all they found on it was his fingerprints. So, you know, the soldier that that's lower torso, it was. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. 30 out six. I mean, that's obviously a civilian weapon. That's obviously a civilian weapon. And what? Well, that brings up another yeah. question. Were in any of the reports that you read, did you see anything that indicated that caches of equipment, human equipment had been found? Definitely. So in one instance, um, I, you know how when an infantry squad will attack an objective, you'll leave your equipment in a pile in the woods. So mm -hmm. this was a, a, a casualty report that happened during a large training event at Fort Lewis, Washington on North Fort, which is a, a very heavily forested, thick old area that was developed during World War II. They had 
you're not going to believe this, 3,000 soldiers out there in the field, right? And some of the soldiers radio back. They say, hey, we've encountered the aggressors, and it seems like they've circled back around and are taking our cash aid AT4s. Because, you know, often whatever equipment is heaviest, you want to cash it in the back, and AT4s are heavy. So they stole, I don't know, it was somewhere in the 20, 20 or 30 rucksacks and about half a dozen AT4s, you know, anti-tank rocket launchers. And uh, they had kind of strewn them about, almost as if they were picking them up and taking them to in order to get whatever was inside of them. And several of the MREs that the soldiers had were ripped. They were all ripped open. And it was obviously some, somebody had just grabbed them with their hands and tore the whole MRE open and ripped the whole package open. And um, Uh, in that instance, three of the 3000 soldiers also went missing when they went to investigate the equipment that was going missing. Wow. Yeah, you know, and I don't. I, I mean, I've seen some of the older MRE packets. You don't right. just grab them and open them up that easily. They're vacuum sealed, and you know, right. I think they use Kevlar. <laughs> you know? They are hard to open. I've got to open them with a pocket knife, personally. <laughs> yeah, you know, I or my keys. If I don't have, didn't have my knife, I would pull out my keys and tear it open with my keys. So it definitely takes some metal or some some serious strength to tear those things open yeah and i think that latter part is sounds like more appropriate yeah Yeah. in that instance they had taken hair samples from around the grass from that area and there and they were the actual hair it was like it was fur that was in these little plastic sheaths that was in the casualty report and they said that um, that hair had been found all around the area where those um, Alice packs and AT4s went missing from. One of the Alice packs was just absolutely torn open also, like someone had ripped the nylon with their hands, which is also rip stop nylon. You know, that stuff is... Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. No, I've got it. one of those old Alice packs. Yeah. Right. Tough. Mill right. spec. Yeah, um, definitely. What? So, uh, I'm curious. So, when a team goes in to investigate and they're gathering evidence, uh, right. it sounds like they're doing. You know, they're they're picking up hair samples, and uh, I assume it gets run through some sort of a process to identify it. Or, or any? Do you have oh, any yeah. idea what that is? Or so SAIC runs that process. Science Applications International Corporation. Yep. They run Somebody a data them. they run a database and they do all the testing of the DNA evidence and all of the casualty evidence and the bone fragments and the hair fragments and the fingernail fragments and the blood splatters from the ground and things like that. Yeah. They definitely database and catalog all that stuff and do as thorough a forensic analysis as they're able to do. Is any of that information included in the reports that you looked at? Um, yeah. So those hair samples were labeled as hair samples, DNA, non-human. Yeah. Wow. And yeah. it was, the hair looked like red hair, you know, the color of, of a human's red hair, but maybe darker and a little wirier. Okay, that's yeah. pretty consistent. Um, yeah. What were your thoughts when you're looking at these reports? Did you have any? Think... <laughs> we yeah, were joking about it. We joked about it a lot. Well, we we said, you know, <laughs> I'm like my friend who is the sergeant and the civilian who were working on that detail with me, burning those records. We <laughs> joked about it. A lot. Quiet, Ollie. It's okay, buddy. 
I always keep dogs with me in the woods for obvious reasons. <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> yeah. I'll have to send you a picture of the mountainous area that we're in right now after we get off the phone. Yeah, and yeah, I have seen a plethora of evidence in the mountains here. Yes, some of the some of the casualty reports that we burned were definitely from Fort Carson. From the mountain training area in Fort Carson. Yeah. What about uh, Montana? Have you I heard that there's some mountain training that went on in Montana. Um, have you heard of any reports uh of these creatures? Were, you know Yeah. There were definitely reports from the mountain training areas in Montana too. That's where they do the ranger school training, you know, now in the mountain training area in Montana. And there were several incidences of people who were doing ranger school that encountered and were injured by simian creatures. Wow. Yeah. And that would have been yeah. what, more Western Montana. Um, you know, it was, it, the records just say mountain training area. Well, that's what they said, if I recall correctly, um, United States army ranger training area, um, Montana. It would have to be Western part because once you get east of the mountains, yeah. it's flat. Yeah. 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 It's up in the high mountainous areas, right? in the foothills of the Rockies, but not too so high that the rangers will die when they're in training. <laughs> right. What, yeah. uh, what yeah. did they specify what the injuries were that some of these, uh, rangers sustained? Yeah, they were rangers in training and also some cadre members. Um, a couple of cadre members just went missing over the years. And ranger cadre, they may be by themselves out in the woods, you know, watching one ranger squad moving on their own, learning their their mountain survival skills, you know, because they, they train them up and then they send them out for two weeks on their own into the mountain training area. So a couple of cadre members over the years had gone missing, one in the 70s, um, one in the 80s and and some in the 90s. And then one strange incident happened in a ranger training area where um, the squad encountered what they described as um, a large hairy man wearing a coat. And uh, that one was funny because it was like a coat from the previous generation of uniforms. The soldiers in the 80s and the soldiers were wearing BDUs and they encountered a large furry creature out in the woods with, um, at first they thought it was their instructor, you know, wearing some kind of a suit. But when, and of course they're delirious because they're, they're um, undergoing food and sleep deprivation during ranger training. <laughs> But uh, they saw this large furry creature and the large furry creature, um, when they went up to see what was going on, challenged him and everything, didn't respond properly, instead went to ground. And so two of them went to investigate and one of them, one of them ended up with a broken arm. And, you know, anytime a soldier's incident is injured at all, it generates a casualty report. So that one was just a broken arm from some furry creature that was definitely not their instructor. <laughs> it's interesting. How could it possibly wear a jacket or some clothing? Because, I mean, they got arms that are the size yeah. of your diameter of your thigh. It would have to have been a smaller one. <laughs> right. And they said that it was frayed. It was an older. Well, you know, a lot of coats, like your field jacket, you want it big so it can fit over your equipment, you know. So maybe yeah. I'm just speculating that perhaps it was torn because they said it looked like a frayed uniform from the previous generation of solid green uniforms. <clears throat> so, wow. And some of them, some of them could, I have to be honest, be hoaxes, you know, because these were thousands of casualty reports that we destroyed. Some of them could have been reports where there was, you know, a human wearing a furry suit trying to scare soldiers or whatever. But most of them were not, 
most of them were destroyed for a reason because it was obvious that they were actual casualty reports. You know, caused by Sasquatches or some other kind of furry creature in the woods. Some of them from Fort Lewis may have been bears, too, because that's hard to say whether it was the bears, a grizzly bear standing up or a Sasquatch. What, um, I'm just curious, you know, when, when, when soldiers do encounter these Sasquatch, mm-hmm. uh, are they given instructions to keep your mouth shut or is there any official, uh, unwritten well, there policy? Wasn't, there wasn't until the late nineties. And then in the late nineties, they started telling us, to leave them alone. Very specifically, hey, if you encounter them, you need to just pull your squads back and leave them alone. Did they say why? No, they didn't. A safety issue. (laughs) Yeah, well, obvious safety issue, that's for sure. I mean, if you're a commander, you want to keep your soldiers safe. And if possibly they'll encounter Sasquatches, you want to tell them, hey, if you see them, get out of the way. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. So they definitely started telling us in the late nineties to leave them alone. And they definitely from 2000 to when I retired in 2014, started fencing off the areas that the casualties occurred in. I can't imagine giving that safety brief. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. If you encounter, well, it's pretty, easy. you know, if you encounter any kind of wildlife, leave the wildlife alone. It was hands off the wildlife from, I guess, about 1998 or 99. We started telling everybody that hands off the wildlife, leave it all alone. There's specific rules, you know, in the hunting areas on post, what you can and can't hunt, too. And I, I've never seen Sasquatch on the hunting, authorized hunting list. <laughs> no, I, right. I can't remember ever seeing anything like that either. <laughs> I no. think in the, it's funny, in 2018, uh, State of Oregon, Hunter synopsis was very crystal clear. They had a little paragraph in there that if you see a Sasquatch, you are not to shoot it. And there could be legal ramifications. Yeah, I do remember that coming out. I think I saw that on the evening news where they were saying that uh, the uh, instructions were to leave other um, bipedal creatures alone and the government was acknowledging that there may be Sasquatches in the woods and that they had their human rights as well. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, um, state of Oregon, uh, the AG's office had a press conference in the early two thousands addressing that. And basically, I mean, they were, they were crystal clear that, you know, if we find so much as a scrap of shared, human DNA and somebody has shot one of these things, you're going to be in some big trouble. And I thought, well, now hang on a second here. Uh, Is this a double-edged sword? Because uh, don't they, you know, what about them? (laughs) What about the people? Yeah. yeah, What about the people? Come on now, you know, Um, especially if in certain instances, the people are being eaten by the Sasquatches, you would want them to defend themselves, obviously. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And you're not going to go and arrest the Sasquatch, but there's got to be some yeah. sort of remediation. I don't know. Um, All right. Yeah, I think maybe maybe the, the answer is just to fence the areas off and let them have their own society. <clears throat> yeah. I think that's kind I mean, of what that, they're doing. Yeah, it hasn't been the, our policy in the past. You know, we didn't do that with the Native Americans, but... Uh, no, if that's what we're doing now. But they weren't eating men either. <laughs> no, uh, well, by as far as we know, maybe some Apaches did later <laughs> on, but uh, they were they were significantly uh, instigated in those instances, shall we say? Yeah, we're pretty well outclassed by these things, so <laughs> definitely, yeah. Oh, yeah, and there's also there was some Native American stories too, because the. Um, some of the army training areas um, abut up against the um, native tribal lands. And there were several of them where tribal hunters had been going into the uh, training area by accident, you know, because you're just walking off in the woods 
and had encountered some um, creatures in the woods and been injured or killed. And then those uh, reports ended up in Army casualty reports because um, it happened on Army land. <laughs> yeah, that was my next question. So this was documented then? Oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Yeah, the Army seemed to be keeping very careful records and not not covering them up, really just filing them, just not necessarily telling anybody about them, just not filing them until we moved the Mortuary Affairs Operations Center from, you know, Alexandria to Fort Knox. And when we moved it, the policy changed. <laughs> you know, they quit quit keeping those reports in the open records. Yeah. Well, I'm curious if they had a very specific, maybe even scientific term for the creatures, you know, where they wouldn't use the word Bigfoot or Sasquatch, something that might have, you know, pass. It'd be hard to do a FOIA on it. Yeah. A lot of the um, casualty reports, you know, soldiers are just like anybody else, except just a little more trained would actually the older ones said Sasquatch or Bigfoot. And then sometime in the seventies or eighties, they started saying ape like creature or simian creature or large ape, different things like that. There was a lot of different terms they used for it. Some of them even said bear like creature. <laughs> I guess that would depend on who was writing the report. Uh, what they would use right it totally just depended on the individual writing the report there they called them all kinds of different things <laughs> yeah i think some of the reports because they're all edited you know before their database some of the reports obviously had cover-up words in them like bear-like creature and uh, you know anthropomorphic creature shadowy creature large ape-like man furry man well a lot of them said tall furry man wow interesting yeah yeah and i don't know of any bears i mean at least here you know i'm just in the pacific northwest here in oregon yeah the big ones are 350 to 400 pounds never seen them really walking much on two legs um and there, there were yeah. The only ones I see standing up are grizzlies, and it's obvious if it's a grizzly or an ape-like creature. Very much. So. Yeah, we Some, we knew there were yeah. a few black bears out at Fort Lewis. In fact, one of my E fours was treed by yeah. one one time, but um, for the most part, we didn't see them. <laughs> That's funny. One of my um, less than uh, brilliant uncles has been treed by bears several times. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. Yeah, you know, he tends to uh, consume a little bit of alcohol when he's going out there hunting and then ends up up a tree with a bear underneath him. It's happened at least half a dozen times. <laughs> I don't know if the bears like his smell or what, but uh, yeah, he gets he's been treated several times. I would change my hunting procedures. <laughs> yeah. <and> tactics. <laughs> After, that after would the take second the brilliant, tree, that'd be it. Or, or your aftershave or something. That I would mean. take a brilliance <laughs> that he lacks, right? And he, he dulls his, his brilliance with um, significant amounts of alcohol, too. <laughs> so, yeah. Alcohol tends to make us learn more slowly. Yeah, it would do it. <laughs> right. I think everybody's got a drunk uncle, right? Yeah. So, Cook those yeah. brain cells, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, have you got any more questions for me? I apologize well, for not being available earlier. That I, I don't know what happened up there. Our friend says that some bandits have stolen the solar batteries that run the cell towers and Wi-Fi up there. But uh, maybe that was a Sasquatch, too. <laughs> I would definitely blame it on Sasquatch. You might as well. Um, That's right. Well, listen, yeah. we got to have you back. This is just too fascinating, and it's been a while that we've uh, been looking forward to chatting with you. So thank you very much for joining us, and hopefully uh, 
our team will get a chance to come out and try out your uh, food there. Absolutely. I heard good stuff. Oh, absolutely. About it. Yeah, we'd love to have you anytime. Come and visit and eat all our delicious food. And uh, if you want, I can even take you out to a very interesting area in the woods. We'd like to oh, see that. Can. From what I understand, those red hair samples from the Lovelock Cave <clears throat> look pretty much identical to the hair samples that we incinerated at Fort Knox. Wow, interesting. You know, that would make sense. Interesting. Yeah. Yep. And I'd love to talk to you again sometime too, and, yeah. and it's been a pleasure. Absolutely. Likewise. Absolutely. we got to have you back, so thank you very much. And uh, sorry for joining a bit late. Just got tied up with some stuff, and so excellent. Oh, that's all right. I was late myself, so apologies from this end as well. <laughs> no no problem. All right. Well, we got to have you back. And Absolutely. Well, real, yeah, good talking to you. Thank you. Absolutely. Have a blessed evening. All right, you do the same now. Thanks for listening to this episode of Creek Devil. If you or anyone you know has had an encounter with these creatures, please contact us at williamjevning at yahoo.com. That's William, J-E-V-N-I-N-G at yahoo.com. All communication is confidential. Join us for another program next week. And until then... Keep your eyes open out there. <laughs>